Welcome everybody. This is the Q&A time. It is 12 o'clock my time here on the East Coast, 1 o'clock in Toronto. And uh, I'm just very, very impressed with all of the incredible questions that you guys have been asking me. They've been very interesting. And of course, I learn as well. Because whenever there's a question that I don't know about, I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to do research. And uh, so welcome, everybody. A few of you joined. Uh, good to see you. And uh, for those of you, if there's any of you who haven't been on this before, then what we're doing is a Q&A session. All you have to do is ask any question that you want that's photo or editing related, and I'd be happy to answer them. And uh, Cinderbug, welcome. Good day, Mark, says Richard. Um, <coughs> Also, the little question mark button is easy for me. I just have to press it to, add, add it to uh, get to your questions. Of course, if you want to, you can do it in the comment section as well. And uh, also, RS Shutter, welcome. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, please tell me uh, what country or what city you're, you're uh, from. It's always fun to see that. Everyone else likes that as well. It's really good to see where in the world you guys are catching me and it's usually I think and I, I don't know I should probably check this out but I, I hope that this time this 1 p.m. Toronto Can Canadian time is good for you know people both in Europe and the uh, the west coast of North America who knows Edmonton from Cinderbug excellent and uh, Pranaga Welcome. Sudanese in Qatar. Excellent. From Turkey, Istanbul, Massachusetts, USA, Geneva. Uh, so good. So good to see you all. Jakarta, Indonesia. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure. Now, there's a couple questions that I didn't get to yesterday. And uh, while I'm answering these questions, please start uh, filling in your questions that you have for yourself. One is about photographing with autofocus and having a hard time with faces and getting the proper focus. Now the issue is, and by the way, okay, here's the question. Hi Mark, <clears throat> when I'm doing portraits and I'm using a low f-stop number, one section of the face, like the nose, could be sharp, but possibly the rest of the picture unsharp. How do I deal with this? That's a very good question. Now if your camera Actually, a lot of cameras, a lot of modern cameras have what's called eye detection. And what you need to do is go into your settings or read your manual probably, because each camera is different, and see if your DSLR or mirrorless camera has eye detection. And this will look intelligently for eyes. And it, it just, you know, probably has a database of thousands of eyeballs and it will select the eye. Now, what I noticed in my Fujifilm X-Pro2 uh, many years ago, is that it also has a priority eye, a left or right, that you can program, or the first eye that is closest to the camera. And that's really interesting. A lot, in fact, I think all the new DSLRs have that as well. And it's very good for portrait photographers who are using a long lens and who are using uh, a wide open lens, or we could say a low f stop number or a wide aperture. And that's really valuable, especially for a full frame camera, because a full frame camera with that long lens and that low f-stop number creates what we call a low depth of field. And that low depth of field means the eyeball, one eyeball could be sharp. And interestingly, another, the other eyeball, the left or the right side could be slightly out of focus, depending on where the portrait or where the model is or where they're positioned rather. So take a look, see if your, if your DSLR or mirrorless has that. Now, if you don't have a DSLR and you have a uh, Android or an iPhone, to be honest, it's not that really, it's not that big a deal because the longest lens that you have is a 50 millimeter equivalent and it's not going to really have that, that really low slice of uh, depth of field. Okay, excellent. Let me pop over here. Okay, Richard, do you have any experience with stop motion? If so, any tips? Yes, the answer is yes.
stop motion is excellent. By the way, if anyone wants to know what that is, it's also, it, you, it's also termed claymation. Um, of course, it's not, uh, they're not completely interchangeable. Claymation is uh, clay figures, usually, traditionally, where you can actually animate them, make them move around. And the earliest, I think, the earliest most popular example of that is our wonderful uh, Christmas um, movies that we see about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Santa Claus the, in those claymations. They're, they were so fun. Anyway, stop motion. If you want to do that, what you need to do is you can't be outside. You can't have window light. You need to have constant, good quality video light. Now, when I say video light, that should be um, good quality LED light banks or even better, tungsten-based video lights. Then use a tripod and you have to do full manual. You can't do aperture priority. You can't do shutter priority. It has to be full manual. And uh, at that point, you're all set. It's really that easy. Now, the hard part is, is just getting those, those figures uh, to uh, move around, if that's indeed what you are referring to. If that doesn't answer your question, I just need a little bit inf more information on the project that you're, you're going to be talking, you're planning to do. Okay. I've got a creative idea, but I'm not sure how to execute it to, uh, to get it looking, to avoid, probably avoid making it look amateur. Yes, uh, follow what I said and um, you will do fine. And they're really fun to do, by the way. If anyone else wants to do that, it's not as easy with uh, full automatic. In fact, it's almost impossible because of the fluctuations in light and exposure. Uh, but if you're on everything manual, you should be fine. Great question. Okay. I want to capture the splash of water if I throw something in the glass. I have a kit lens and a zoom. 50 to... Let's see what the other is here. 50 to 200. But when I increase the shutter speed, the image goes black even with high ISO and shutter priority. Yeah, you... Okay, here's my advice. If you switch to aperture priority, now I know this seems... By the way, what, what, what's being asked here is how to get those um, wonderful shots of water splashing and it's super sharp when you throw something in the water. Now to get this, traditionally you need a flash. And the reason being is you need to jam that picture with so much light that I can probably guarantee you it's not going to work unless it's blaring sun coming through your window. I'm talking direct sun shooting the object because you need so much light in order to freeze the motion so that you get that wonderful um, splash of water. So your, your gear is fine, but I'm going to get you to write down these, these tips. Make sure that the sun is shining directly on your subject unless you have uh, flash, flash uh, like a uh, strobes or, or anything in a studio. Go to aperture priority. And I know this sound, you should be using shutter priority. I know, but I'm just going to get you to go in stages here. Aperture priority. And then I want you to go to your highest ISO and find out what the shutter speed is. This is a test, by the way. And if your shutter speed is like around 1 over 2,000 or 1 over 1,000, that will probably work better if it's 1 over 4,000. Now, once you get used to that and you start getting good results, then you can go to shutter priority or manual and start playing around with that. However, I do suggest aperture priority first just so that you get a feel <clears throat> for how the higher ISO affects your shutter speed. And you're looking for 1 over 2,000 or 1 over 4,000. Now, the reason why it didn't work for you and it was all black, is because in shutter priority, you're not, you don't have the, uh, when, you, when you jacked up the shutter, you didn't have enough light or ISO even. Even if you went to the highest ISO, it still wouldn't have worked because it's not enough ambient light. Great question. Okay, let's see what else we have. <clears throat> what settings lens should I use for headshots? Excellent question. Now, if you have a zoom lens, then you're, what we usually call uh, the 70 to 200, or if you have a smaller APS-C size camera, it would usually be a 55 
to 200 or you know it depends on the on the uh, the company but usually the uh, 105 to 135 millimeter focal length is preferred for headshots now if you have a full frame camera that's going to be uh, anywhere between that 105 or 135 and you can get those in prime lenses which are really good or of course just use your normal zoom lenses your telephoto zoom lenses and you will be really well positioned to get that headshot for actors. You would use your lowest, if you have a background, by the way, you would use your lowest f-stop number. We say that the lens is wide open. And the reason being is you want the background to be blurry. You would use aperture priority and you would adjust. And as for your ISO, if you're using a tripod, use the lowest ISO possible. That would be ISO 100. If you're handheld, you would use auto ISO. And you would adjust the exposure depending on the background. If the background's dark, you're going to have to actually underexpose. And you would do that with something called exposure compensation dial. That's the minus and the plus. Okay, now if you are in studio, then it's a whole different story. So you'd st still use a tripod. You would still use aperture priority. And th but you don't have to really blur the background so much because your background may be a solid color like a, a white we would call it a sweep, a studio background. Then your aperture could be anything that you want. Okay? And uh, as long as your shutter speed doesn't go below 1 15th or 1 30th of a second on the tripod, you should be fine. And I'd always advise to use, I always advise that you use a shutter release cable or a remote. And that will give you that much more sharpness. Great question. By the way, um, for those of you who uh, just joined, we're doing a Q&A session. I'm happy to answer anything that you have. Okay. What is the combination of ISO and f-stop that always works in daylight photos? Yes, excellent question. So I'll tell you my go-to. And my go-to is something that uh, I'm intimately familiar with because a lot of my work is actually at the worst time of day, which is noon, harsh, you know, midday light, because in street photography, that's usually the best time to get your street, street photos. What I do is I use aperture priority, I use auto ISO, and oftentimes I do suggest that if you are in a very shadowy, highlight, shadow, highlight environment, because you're walking through a city, that you keep a lower f-stop number. For example, your lowest f-stop number may be f4.5 or f2.8. And the reason being is that it's, um, I want to make sure that you all get the shot and get it, sh get it done quickly. Now, traditionally, street photography, uh, I know this is not directly your question, but street photography traditionally used a 35 millimeter lens and usually about an f8. And the reason being is that the, the photographers using, using Leica uh, cameras that didn't have autofocus, they would just want to make sure they would have that focus latitude where they could get focus even if their focus, their physically manual, manual focus was off a little bit. That's where the F8 or F11 came in handy. However, if you're using autofocus, I would advise going to a lower f-stop number and the reason why I say aperture priority, lower f-stop number, and your auto ISO in daylight is because you want to make sure that you get the shot quickly. And you can adjust your exposure with your exposure compensation button, and that's the minus and the plus. Okay, so I hope that helped. And that's not just for street photography. That's for even outdoor wedding photography or, or sports photography that's outside, possibly. Excellent question. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else we have here. I have almost a thousand photos. I really don't know. Should I start editing them? <laughs> I know you're feeling. I know what you're 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 uh, encountering here, Shahir, because I have uh, thousands of photos that are unedited as well. Now these are ones way back. I, I do keep anything you know from the past. I don't know, five or six years, I've been very diligent. So all my photos are up to date, but way back, they're still in my Lightroom archive in a folder called To Edit. And I don't know if I'll ever get around to that. I think that you'd probably go insane, Shahir, to be honest. 
And the reason being is that you would just feel it's a job. And I don't want photography and editing to be a chore. I want it to be fun. So what I advise is you just leave them alone. That's what I do. Because I have thousands and thousands of photos that are from my history, my archives, that I don't bother doing anything with. However, I do go back to them. And I go back for specific purposes. For example, if a client says, Mark, do you have any photos of New York City, for example? Well, yes, I do. And they go back a number of years. So even though I didn't edit them back then, well, it only take me 20 minutes to edit a whole bunch of them in my archives. Now, interestingly, I put all of my archives into the Creative Cloud. That's by Adobe. And I use Adobe Lightroom CC. And that means that I have access to editing all of my entire history, 23 years worth of photos, simply using my iPhone. Isn't that great? And all of it is accessible on my iPhone. I just need an internet connection or, or you know, if I don't have internet, I can switch to uh, my normal cell phone signal and still have access to those photos. So do it piecemeal. Don't think that you have to go all the way back to all those photos because it'll just become a chore and it won't be enjoyable. Great question. Okay, let's see what else we have here. I don't want to miss any of these. So I'm trying to go in order. What f-stop number should I use for freezing the splash of water in Aperture Priority? Ah, yes. I didn't mention that probably. Uh, with regards to, to that, if you use a lower f-stop number, you're going to in turn get a faster shutter speed. So what is your lowest f-stop number on your lens? I, I would suggest that. But of course, do a pre-focus. So what you're going to do is focus your lens on the, on the area, that, that section, where you think that you're going to drop the object into the water. And if you do that pre-focus and then turn it to manual focus you should be fine with your lowest f-stop number possible. By the way, the lower the f-stop, the, fa the uh, faster the shutter speed, usually, and that's of course based on your choices of ISO. Excellent question. Okay, let's see what we got here. Shahir, which setting is better for traveling urban photography? I would say the exact same. Consider travel and urban photography the same as street. You're using a lower f-stop number like f5.6 or f4.2 or f, sorry f4 or f2.8. And the reason why I'm suggesting this is because often when we're walking through streets or we're traveling, we're going to be photographing both in deep shadow and in bright highlights. And often we don't have time to adjust our settings every time we walk into the shade. It's impractical. That's why I really advise people to have your camera set up so that it'll work quickly in both shadow and highlight. That's why I advise auto ISO. I advise a lower f-stop number, aperture priority, and you'd be good to go. Excellent question, thank you. Okay, let's see what we have here. Shahir, I have an 11 to 16 millimeter and a 50 millimeter. What should be next? Uh, Shahir, can you let me know if you have an APS-C size camera or a full frame? And that would, that would really help me. Do East Photography, welcome. Hope all is well, wherever you are. Okay, let's pop into the questions here. Regarding the food photography, how do you like to see them? How do you feel about dark food photos, or can we try... Sorry about this. How could you, or can we try something new? Yeah, good question. So, uh, with regards to food photography, it's primarily about what the end use is. So, for example, when I do food photography in studio, I don't do it too much anymore because I, I don't have a studio anymore. I used to. Uh, what I would do is I'd, I'd really carefully work with the art director and find out what the the color palette, uh, the brand colors of the clients are, and make sure that I'm working within the tonal range of what the, uh, the advertising output is. Now, if you're not doing this for clients, and you're doing it for yourself, it's very simple. If you are wanting this to be a light and, and uh, happy looking food photo shoot, then you're going to be going what's called high key. 
Now high key means you're using a, a white background, like a white Bristol board, you're, or light, uh, and you're doing frontal lighting, side lighting, and back lighting, and you're making this look as bright and appealing as possible. Now if you're looking for maybe more drama, because you're photographing, um, uh, what would you say, uh, like for example when I photograph wine and beer back in the day, if the client was edgy then I would have what's called low-key lighting where I would really shoot light onto one aspect of the food or the product and I would use a darker background and that would be either gray or dark or black Bristol board that I got at the local art store or dollar store. Now these types of lighting scenarios are based entirely on what you want to present to the public and that's something that you have, you have to decide and you choose the background accordingly. Excellent question. I love food photography, by the way. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have here. Yusuf, how can we get rid of image grain in post-processing? I have an iPad only for post-processing. Yes, okay, so image grain can be removed through using the, Lightroom, the Adobe Lightroom CC mobile app. And if I recall, the grain reduction tool within that app for your iPad is in the free version. That's good news. So feel free to download that and you should be able to get it for free. If I'm mistaken and it's in the paid version, well, it may only be $6 a month and all you have to do is just try it out and if you don't like it, then cancel at the end of the month and it's no big deal. By the way, if you hear a, a crazy sound in my microphone. It's the heat pump. <laughs> and uh, man, it's really loud today. Okay, let's get to another question. Um, Shahir says it's a Canon ADD crop sensor. Okay. Um, Shahir, I think that if you already have a 50 millimeter and you have a, a wider zoom, I am a big fan of prime lenses and your, your 50 millimeters of prime. What I love is the 85. It's so versatile and the 85 is not, not too expensive. And if you get the two, uh, uh, what is it? I think it's an F 1.8 or maybe there's an 85 that's an F 2.8. I'm not sure, but, um, look into that. Don't be afraid of getting used. Used lenses are perfectly fine, but that's, that would be my suggestion simply because I love the sharpness, the lightness, the, the clarity, and the longevity of the prime lenses. By the way, prime lenses, which are non-zooming, usually last longer and are sharper, mainly because there's less moving parts. There are less, when there's less moving parts in any machine or any object, there's a greater chance of a, more of a longer lifespan. And because there's fewer glass elements, usually, in a prime lens, you are actually potentially getting a sharper picture as well. Very good. Okay, <clears throat> let's scroll here. Let's see what we got. Um, soulful lens, welcome. Part one, I have an 18 to 200 lens, practicing birds, still in flight. At 200 millimeter, prick picks are often grainy. Okay, I'll just pop over to part two. Thanks for doing that, by the way. Uh, part one and part two. Uh, how can I improve sharpness quality? Okay, so grain and sharpness are very different. They're not, uh, they're completely different actually, even though it seems to be similar. And <clears throat> the scenario that's happening is, actually, may, I might ask you a question. If you could please tell me, is the bird in flight very grainy, but sharp, or is the grain and the bird is blurry? So, I'll get you to, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, answering that. And then I can answer your question a bit better. Okay, perfect. By the way, for those who just joined, we're doing a Q&A session. And uh, if you have any questions about photography or apps or editing, anything you want, I'm happy to help out. Okay, let's scroll through here. And by the way, I'd love to hear from wh where you're coming from, what country. Sorry, everybody, I'm just scrolling here. Hope you're warmer. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. Corey? Yes, it's a little bit warmer today. It's, yeah, for those who are in the world of metric, I think it's four degrees. And that's actually promising because it's above freezing. 
Alessandra, welcome. Um, Yusuf. Okay, one second here. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm back. Yusuf, hello Mark. What do you think about those magnifying filters that are placed just in front of the lens? They usually serve for macro photography, for example. Yusuf, I think they're great. Now, they will never be as good quality as a true macro lens, but what I do advise, <coughs> especially if, excuse me, <coughs> what I do advise is that if you want to get into macro photography but don't have the money yet to get a macro lens, then you get those close-up filters, and they're pretty cheap, and you can get them at any camera store pretty much or online, and they're called close-up filters. They come in different strengths or magnifications, and it doesn't matter which one you get. Sometimes you can get a multi-pack, like a three-pack, and each one of those has a different magnifying factor. I definitely advise those. <clears throat> okay. I'm just giving you guys some waves, looking for questions here that I missed. <coughs> Joseph, <coughs> excuse me. How about doing those splash shots outside using a flash? Yes, definitely. So in order, uh, just in addition to when I was talking about getting those, fla those splash shots with water, I said that direct sunlight, I mean like direct, harsh, super sun, would work, but it's always better to use a strobe. And the high sink strobe that you're talking about, Joseph, would be absolutely ideal. And by the way, if anyone wants to know more about this, strobist.com, that's S-T-R-O-B-I-S-T.com, is a far better resource than what I can give on using your strobes, which are your, your uh, flash. It's called a flash. Uh, a flash is called a strobe in, in, uh, or speed light in photography lingo. And you can use those off your camera to create amazing freezing, uh, frozen splash water photos. Excellent. Okay, just scrolling here. What would be your trick to fix a sharp subject when you, when, when you follow a moving person or animal and want the effect of a dynamic, dynamic background? Excellent question. I love this. So this, I do this a lot, by the way, especially in cities. And I learned about this long, long ago in Tokyo because I photographed taxis um, going by me in uh, Shinjuku, Tokyo. And the reason why that was valuable, and I bring this up, is because that the light in Tokyo, and this would be the same in New York City or any big city, it allows you to photograph the, uh, like say a cyclist or a taxi or a car or a person running and have a very interesting colorful background. And that background is the lights of the city. Now what you do, there's a number of things that you can do. All you have to do is, you can do this in aperture priority or shutter priority. All you're looking for is a shutter speed of one over 115 or one, one fifteenth of a second. Now, the reason why I say this is because usually you have to do a test and um, when you're panning, sorry, let me back up. If anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, picture this. Let's just use, for example, a taxi going through a city street. You want to photograph that taxi sharp, but the rest of the image, the background, the city, is a nice streaming blur of neon colored lights or whatever. It's very easy to do, but it takes practice. And if anyone knows anything about hunting, I don't, or, but skeet shooting, I think, is the same. What you do is you're following that skeet or that disc that goes up in the air, and then you take the, take the shot, but then you keep following through. In the same manner, in order to get this shot, you're gonna follow the taxi with your lens, with your camera, Take the picture at one fifteenth of a second and then keep following through until you're sure that the picture has been finished. And in fact, even when the picture finishes, you should just keep panning for maybe a, a one second more. It's just good practice. Now, the reason I say one fifteenth of a second is because that's a usual good shutter speed for such subjects. Now, if the, if the person or the subject or the taxi or the cyclist or the motorcyclist is going faster or slower, what I want you to do is go to 1 30th of a second or 1 8th of a second. That's on either end of 1 15th. 1 15th is a default. That's what you practice with. And then when you have, when you know that that's going to work for your, the speed of your subject matter, then you can go ahead and get the real shots. I hope that helps.
Great question. Okay, Joseph, are you not worried about too much grain when putting ISO on auto? No, not at all. That's a great question, by the way. Um, <coughs> um, oh, gee. Pause due to poor connection. Hopefully it'll come back on. Hi everybody, sorry, it got paused by because of low Wi-Fi or something. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, Joseph, you were just mentioning about um, being afraid of low of noise uh, or grain with high or auto ISO. Um, actually, because cameras are so good these days, I jack up my ISO and I don't even care. Um, the uh, The quality of the sensors, any any camera that's three years old or newer, it shouldn't be a problem. Now it's true you're gonna you're gonna capture noise with uh, the, the the highest ISO. But to be honest, here's here's what I suggest. This is my mantra: it's better to get the shot with grain than to miss the shot because of a low ISO. So if uh, <laughs> if you want to have a good quote, there you there you go. Make sure you uh, credit me. I'll say it again: it's better to have it's better to get the shot with grain than to miss the shot because of a slow shutter speed. And so higher ISOs give you a faster shutter speed. Now, of course, this is meaningless if you're using a tripod, if your subject matter is still, but if you're a, uh, someone who does weddings or sports or street photography or travel photography, when you have unpredictability, then you want that auto ISO on and you want to make sure that um, you have a fast enough shutter speed and that, that auto ISO will pretty much guarantee it. Great question. Okay, Shahir, sorry if I'm asking a lot. Uh, I love questions. Of course, um, you're not asking too much. Okay, let's see what else we have here. For landscape photography, what filter set would you recommend for beginners? Thanks. Yeah, a polarizer. Polarizers are great. And uh, the reason being is that if you're doing any work on water, you can actually reduce the highlight reflections that often happen with waves, uh, little flickering waves. And uh, it also deepens the blue sky. Now, it's true that you can do this post-processing in Photoshop or Lightroom. And that's a, a usual uh, excuse. But one thing that's a, bit, a lot harder, actually, is to deal with those specular highlights that come from the waves on either an ocean or a lake or whatever. And that's where the polarizer comes in handy that um, it's going to really reduce those reflections and make that blue water look really great. And beyond that, if you don't, you, when you don't need a polarizer, uh, you're just going to be using a normal UV filter. And that's the, the protective filter that comes, either comes with a lot of lenses and package deals, or you just go out and buy it. And that will protect your lens and to a small degree help with UV blue light in distant mountain scenes. It doesn't do such a great job, but it helps a little bit. Excellent question. Okay, does it matter, Dewey's photography, does it matter that I can't pick a particular focus for my photography? Oh, are you talking about like uh, um, a genre? Well, one sec. Not really. Because I, I know you and I've been watching your photos, I would suggest be a, uh, have, have many hats. In fact, because you want to get into this as a career, which I think would be, or at least a second income, uh, I think it's a great idea to learn every genre of photography possible. And uh, don't bother trying to specialize yet. Specializing is dangerous. Specialists have a hard time when their certain, the certain genre that they specialize in goes out of fashion or is, has an issue. Like for example, right now, during the COVID crisis, if I was just a photographer who only shot, well, I could think of anything. If I was just a photographer, for example, who, who could only do photo shoots outside, I would be in big trouble. But I do so many different things in the world of photography that, and so many different income streams that, uh, you know, it's no, it's no big deal. I've, I've been home for two or three weeks doing nothing. Well, doing stuff, but I haven't been doing photo shoots. 
And what I advise anyone wanting to get into photography for either a career or extra money on the side is try not to go too much into thinking that being a specialist is the greatest thing. I would prefer that all of you learn as many genres as possible to be as employable as possible and to get as many contract jobs and freelance jobs as possible within many different genres. Really good question. Okay, hello, I'm a big fan of your advice. Thank you. The way you explain everything is just awesome to understand. Respect from India. And I want to send respect to all my Indian friends. India is a place that I've only been to once and I dearly love it and I am desperate to return. Thank you so much. All the best for my Indian friends. Vienna at 25 Celsius. I'm at 5 Celsius now. One degree more, which is good. Enjoy Vienna sunshine. Uh, Hi, Mark. Which do you prefer, the 70 to 200 plus teleconverter times 2 or the 200 to 500? Well, because I don't like wasting money, I would prefer the times 2 teleconverter. And the reason being is because I'm not a safari photographer and I'm not a sports photographer by trade. I would find much more value and use out of the 70 to 200 with a 2 times teleconverter. And, there, and I'll, I'll tell you why is because the 200 to 500 has limited use. It's extremely necessary for a certain, for only a couple genres of photography, and that's safari, that's bird photography, wildlife, and sports. Other than that, you're not gonna get much use out of, that, out of that lens. However, if you buy that 2X teleconverter, or X2 times two teleconverter, and use your 70 to 200, you're gonna use your 70 to 200 every day almost. It's a really good deal. By the way, if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, a teleconverter is a little lens that goes in between your camera and your actual lens. And that is a magnifying glass, essentially. And it allows your lens to be doubled if you get the, the uh, times 2 or the 2x version or, or if you get a 1.5 multiplication teleconverter, it's a 1.5x. And I, I think they're great value. It's a very good idea. Okay, was it strobus.com, do East Photography? Yes, that's exactly right. Okay. Thank you for the, <laughs> love the quote. Thank you, Joseph. And interestingly, by the way, if someone wants to test their ISO, uh, what I advise that you do is you go outside, your, or if you can't get outside, because of uh, our COVID scenario, just shoot out the window. And do it, shoot out the window at your lowest ISO and your highest ISO on aperture priority. And then do the exact same thing indoors. Now, indoors, the picture's gonna be shaky, so put your camera on your counter, your table, on a tripod. And what I want you to do is ask yourself this. Is the highest ISO terrible or is it passable? Okay, if it's terrible, if it's garbage, then I want you to go down to the second lowest ISO and do the exact same test. And I want you to take notes with a pen and pencil, a pen and paper. And I want you to decide with regards to outdoor scenes and indoor scenes, where is the acceptability point with regards to IS, high ISO and when does it fall apart? And if you keep that note in your, in your camera bag, then you will know that this is the maximum ISO I ever want to go to, and I don't want to go beyond that. By the way, most cameras have what's called um, a programmable auto ISO. If you look in your ISO settings, you're going to see auto 1, auto 2, and auto 3. All three of those autos are programmable, and that, give, that tells the camera a ceiling, a high level of ISO that you do not want to surpass. For example, a lot of people program auto ISO 1 at 800. They program auto ISO 2 at 1600. And they program auto ISO 3 at the maximum ISO possible. That's what I do. Those are the three parameters for the three autos. Give that a try. Okay. Mark, I can't hear you properly. Internet issue may be. Please put the recording in Insta so I can check it later. Yes. Um, I'm having terrible trouble... <laughs> probably a lot of us are because everybody in the world is on the internet at the same time and mine's cutting in and out and I apologize for that 
So what you can do is I believe, and please take a look, tr please take a, a test on this and get back to me if you can. I believe that this live Instagram goes to my Instagram stories as soon as I'm finished. If that's the case, then you guys can watch this again uh, about maybe three or four minutes after on my Instagram stories. <clears throat> and I've, I do plan to put all of them up on my YouTube, and that's Mark Hemmings Photography School on my YouTube, so check that out as well. Okay, <clears throat> let's see what else we have. <clears throat> Sammy Whammy 30, that's a great name. I have an A6000, that's a Sony by the way, with a Sigma 30, mil 30 millimeter. My photo doesn't come out as sharp as with the same gear when clicked by someone else. Okay, Sammy, what I need you to do is find an unsharp or picture that you're not pleased with. And I want you to tell me either today in the comment section or tomorrow, what is the shutter speed, the aperture, uh, and what, um, what mode did you shoot in? Essentially, just find out that information. You can find that information, actually, by looking at the picture on the back of your camera when you have that picture, um, when you're reviewing that picture in your camera. Write them down, and then please uh, get back to me, because I need more detail, and I'll be able to help you. Okay, let's see what else we have. Where are you, says uh, E.K. Nadan. I am in eastern Canada, and uh, it's on some, a place called the Bay of Fundy, which is uh, on the, the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, it's usually not so warm here, to be honest, but we have beautiful summers here and beautiful fall. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And for those who just joined, we're doing a Q&A session, and we have uh, a few minutes left. Hi Mark, Carmen from Slovenia here. I just finished your digital camera mastery course. I must say, listening to you is like meditation. <laughs> That's awesome. I really, truly appreciate that. You're so calm and cool a guy and a wonderful teacher. Well, that made my day. Thank you so much. And um, uh, by the way, Carmen, uh, if you, because you've gone through my course, and by the way, what she's referring to is my online photo courses that you can find at my website, markhemmings.com. And there's four online courses there. And uh, Carmen, I want you to always feel free to shoot me any questions, direct message or email, uh, if you ever run into any questions or, or struggle, because um, I, I want to make sure that you get your value out of that course. So always feel free to uh, lean on me for any questions that you may have. Okay. <clears throat> awesome, Joseph. I, I'm glad I could help. Um, do you watch your followers' pictures on IG? Yes, I do. Um, and actually, uh, here's something that not many people know. But I spend an hour and a half to two hours commenting on all of your photos and, and uh, liking them. Now, is, uh, why do I do this? Because I, I honestly, and this isn't a sales gimmick because I'm not really selling anything except my courses, online but i really want you guys to succeed and when i when we didn't have the covid crisis my daily ritual would go to i would go to one of um three or four of my favorite cafes in my city and spend uh, an hour and a half just going through uh, all of uh, all of your instagram and facebook feeds and uh, answering questions drinking my favorite espresso or cappuccino. And when I'm traveling, I'm doing the same thing, except if I'm in the Middle East, I'm drinking Turkish coffee, which I love. Okay, um, uh, I totally agree with Carmen, a spectacular teacher. Thank you, Alessandra, so much, I appreciate it. Uh, Mark, how to be good at uh, composing pictures based from your own experience? Yes, so the first, the fundamental is called the rule of thirds. That's a tic-tac-toe grid that you can actually place on your camera or on your iPhone or Android. And just learn about how to compose landscapes using the bottom, sorry, the horizontal thirds and compose street photography or travel photography or any other photography using the vertical left and right third points or third lines. And after that, you can break those rules. It's uh, really good to learn the rules of composition and then break them. What I would advise, by the way, is that, one second, is that <clears throat> for the past five years, 
or maybe even more, maybe it goes way back, almost every single photo in my Instagram and my Facebook feed are photo lessons. <laughs> if I look back, you know, every single photo, as far as I can remember, has an attached photo lesson. And they're all free. It's, it's like an entire school on my Instagram feed. So <clears throat> all I, I would say is that if you want a fun, hopefully a fun, afternoon, <laughs> just go through my Instagram feed. And uh, I talk a lot about composition. There's so much info on composition because that's what I love to teach on. Excellent question. <clears throat> okay. Composing, I mean. Yes. I, when I first read it, I was thinking you were talking about a composting toilet or uh, composting your food waste. No, I'm just joking. Yes, composing. I suggest that you go through my Instagram and I have a ton of information on composition. Oh, I'd love to come to Turkey. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to pop over to the question marks. Okay, with four-thirds, 40 to the 150, F4, 5.6, what is the most setting works for panning to catch a bird in daylight? Um, I think I missed part, the first, part one of that question. Hold on. Let's see what we got here. Sorry for the delay here. When I zoom in, it's mostly grainy, not too blurry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is soulful lens. I understand what you're saying. So <clears throat> don't worry about grain. And here's the thing. This is what I want you to do. I want you to, next time you have the opportunity to go for bird, bird photography, um, depending on how fast the bird is going, you want to have a shutter speed of one over one, oh, one over 1000. That's, that's a guess of mine. So you can actually um, you can actually take a look at the uh, the aperture one second what I want you to do let me back up what I want you to do soulful lens is find out on the back of the camera when you look at that picture what the shutter speed aperture is and what mode and then I'd like you to DM that info to me because I'm running out of time. Uh, it's uh, Instagram shuts me off uh, in a couple minutes, I think. And then tomorrow, I, I'll, I'll reply to you, but tomorrow I'm actually going to bring this up because it's really important because a lot of people like bird photography. And uh, I have to unpack the shutter priority situation because a lot of people correctly say well when we want to have bird photography and we want to have a one over 1000 shutter speed we should use shutter priority the answer is yes but there's a problem with shutter priority and that is that if you're not in ideal lighting conditions and you're not using auto ISO then there are times when your picture will be either too dark or too bright and that's why I usually suggest first aperture priority with a bunch of different options but because I want to give you a really detailed, accurate answer, please DM me that information, the full information of that photo. And I will reply to you, but also bring that up as a lesson for tomorrow. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> Would you please compare Photoshop and Lightroom? Which one should I choose for learning? It seems Photoshop is more common. Okay, Photoshop is complex and it is complicated and it's not user friendly. Lightroom CC is very powerful, very user friendly, has an easy to understand UI or user interface and is quite as a pleasure to use. <laughs> so uh, my vote for you is Lightroom CC. And you can start out with a free, ver free trial. Then you can start out with Lightroom CC free on a mobile app or your iPad or Android or tablet. And then if you like it, then you can go for the paid monthly version, which unlocks a lot of great features like selective editing. You can do selective brushwork, selective um, uh, linear gradients, circular gradients, or radial gradients. It's really quite excellent. By the way, if anyone wants to learn Lightroom, I do have a, a course that's devoted entire to, entirely to Lightroom editing. And it's, uh, it's called Lightroom Editing Mastery, and it's um, on my website, markhemmings.com. 
Okay, hope that answered. I love Lightroom. By the way, before I get to the next question, I love Photoshop too, and I use Photoshop. But nowadays, I don't use Photoshop uh, hardly at all, except for when I'm doing layers. When I'm doing layers work, I flip over to, light, uh, to Photoshop because Lightroom serves all of my purposes almost. Excellent question. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Any plans to come to the Middle East? Shahir, um, I'm always wanting to. I've, I, I've been to Jerusalem twice, and I plan to do a Jerusalem photo workshop this, sept this coming September. However, though, that may not happen depending on, uh, of course, uh, the ability to travel. And I would always, uh, of course, respect all international guidelines on travel. Of course, the, the big one, biggest one is, uh, of course, the Israeli government allowing people to come in. Yeah, of course, uh, I'm not going to do a workshop if, uh, if travel is not advisable. Anyway, that's my next Middle East adventure is uh, teaching photography in Jerusalem. And I'm so excited about that. By the way, if anyone wants to know the workshops that I do, I do them in Jerusalem, Japan, uh, Mexico, Italy, many places. And they're all found at markhemmings.com. That's my website. And uh, I usually have about five or six. I do them in Greece, five or six per year. And of course, uh, the, uh, the COVID crisis uh, stopped those for obvious reasons. But um, I would never do a workshop where it would endanger people. So I'm not going to restart them until it's safe to restart them. Excellent, Shahir. Thank you. Okay, Shahir says, please review my photos if you can. So um, what the best way, by the way, I often, as much as I try to, I try to get to everyone, but because I get, hundreds, almost hundreds, and sometimes more, um, what would you say, communications per day, a lot of it goes off. Uh, I, I can't get to them physically. However, if you tag me in Facebook, and it's not me personally, it's not Mark Hemmings, it's Mark Hemmings Photography, and if you tag me in Instagram and say specifically, Mark Hemmings, can you take a look at this? It's usually, I'm usually able to do that much better than answering emails or, or other things. Um, and it, it entirely, I've been able to do more of that lately because I've been indoors, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best. How's that sound? Keep, okay. EK. Key points of photo composition. Yes. So what I advised um, about five minutes ago, and it's not because I'm lazy. I don't want, it's not because I don't want to answer the question, but uh, my time's running out uh, for this, this live session. But what I advise is that you go through my history of my Instagram posts and because every single one has a lesson and a lot of them have to do with composition. So, if you, for example, if you just scroll through my Instagram when we, when we hang up from this call, as it were, uh, you'll see Mexico and then back earlier Japan and then back earlier, uh, I think Greece and a whole bunch of countries. And each one, I give a photo lesson and a lot are on composition. Okay. <clears throat> I'll try to get, squeeze in one or more, one or two more, and then I have to say goodbye to you all. I'll just scroll here. Okay. Ah, scrolling is tough. Okay. Stay safe and healthy, Mark. I will. When you, uh, Alessandra, when you have to print an image and the company asks for a TIFF image, how can you do that? Very easy. Uh, Alessandra, if you're using Lightroom CC or Lightroom Classic or Photoshop, then you just export. Oh, hold on now. I'm just rethinking this. Lightroom CC exports as the original. It doesn't offer a TIFF option. So what you need to do, Alessandra, is if you don't have Photoshop, because Photoshop exports as TIFF, um, you're going to have to send your, your JPEG or your original RAW to a friend and ask them to export it as a TIFF. That's my advice. Because I just realized that TIFF is not that 
you know, it's not going out of style at all. It's a great format. Um, however, uh, when you're dealing with Lightroom, I notice I don't think Lightroom, as far as I can remember, exports as TIFF. It exports as the original. Now, if your original is a TIFF, then you're all set. It'll export as a TIFF. But if your original was a JPEG or a RAW, then it's going to export as either a JPEG, if you tell it just a JPEG, or it's going to export as that RAW, and it won't export as a TIFF. So that's my advice. Get a friend who has Photoshop to export it as a TIFF, and you will be all set. By the way, TIFFs are very large in file size. They're high quality, and you may not be able to email it. Just FYI, you'll probably have to Dropbox it or send it through a file transfer program. New Zealand workshop would be amazing. I would love to visit New Zealand. Um, have no plans for it, but for anyone who has a, a huge, uh, well, not a huge, if anyone has a lot of friends or maybe even, maybe even a handful who want to bring me over to their country to do a photo workshop, I'm totally able, uh, of course, when COVID finishes. And, um, you know, I, I don't advertise that, but, uh, uh, you just put, you know, get your friends together, put some money together, advertise it, charge a high amount, make sure you guys make a profit, cover my costs, plus a little bit more, and, and we're all set. It'd be fun. I, I am totally open to uh, doing any photo workshops that are custom created by, by you guys. Okay, do I have to do it in Photoshop, Alessandra? Yes. As far as I can tell, now there are some apps that will export as TIFF, but they're rare. And I don't even remember which ones they are. But um, Alessandra, is, is it a JPEG? Um, in, in fact, if you don't have any friends who have Photoshop, <clears throat> you can just email me the picture and I'll export it as a TIFF for you. Okay. Shahir, thanks a lot. You're such a great guy. I appreciate that so much. Lightroom Mobile is exporting TIFF. Okay, Shahir, you... You are a gem. So, Alessandra, Shahir says that Lightroom Mobile does export as a TIFF. Okay. Um, I should check on that because uh, I, was, uh, I was unaware of that. In any case, Alessandra, let me know if I can help you um, regardless. Okay. Excellent. Well, we can very conveniently, I've wrapped all the questions. I often don't get to the chance to finish the questions, actually. But I have one minute left, and then I'm going to be sh uh, shut off by Instagram. So I'm going to say goodbye. And uh, let's check back tomorrow. And uh, I hope all of you do well. Stay creative. Keep photographing through your window or out your backyard. Or use apps to uh, keep those creative juices flowing. God bless. See you later.